Did you figure out that? Yeah, that's what I see on here now that they were saying. Today, research and exploration vessels, including the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration ship Oceanus Explorer and the Ocean Exploration Trust Exploration Vessel Nautilus, as well as other ships, carry crew, scientists, and technologies across the global ocean. We can even use tools in outer space to understand Earth's inner space. This map of the Earth was created using large-scale satellite data. It reveals the irregularities of the seafloor and hints at amazing landscapes hidden beneath the waves. But the resolution of this map is coarse. To see what the ocean floor really looks like, a more precise system is needed. Ship-based multi-beam sonar provides much more accurate detail on ocean depth. Multi-beam sonar works like this. Acoustic transmitters mounted on the hull of the ship send out a fan of underwater sounds called pings. These pings travel through the water column, bounce off features in the water column and or the seafloor, and return to the ship. The time it takes for the pings to travel round trip is translated into water depth. Detailed, high-resolution, color-coded 3D maps of the seafloor, such as that shown here, shallower water. As the waters deepen, the colors shift to dark blue and purple. The depth and shapes of the underwater terrain is referred to as bathymetry. An underwater terrain more varied and dramatic than that on land has been revealed. Majestic sea mounts rise up from the ocean floor, some linked together to make vast underwater mountain chains. Huge canyons and trenches, some deeper than the Grand Canyon, carve a jagged path into the ocean bottom. Sonar pings bounce off bubbles escaping from cracks in the seafloor. These bubble detections have led to major discoveries of deep sea vents and seeps. Through the lens of multi-beam sonar, we've even had our first look at previously undiscovered shipwrecks. Multi-beam bathymetric maps allow scientists to pinpoint areas of interest. Remotely operated vehicles, or ROVs for short, are deployed to further explore these deep ocean targets. ROVs are highly maneuverable underwater robots. They're connected to the main vessel by a flexible stainless steel tether and are driven by pilots on board the ship. There's no limit to how long an ROV can remain in depth. This ability to provide around-the-clock underwater observation has transformed ocean exploration. An ROV's powerful lights illuminate the dark, deep ocean environment, hot spots of biodiversity that can be protected as national monuments and marine sanctuaries. Vivid imagery of fascinating creatures excite, captivate, and sometimes puzzle observers on the other end of the camera feed. ocean exploration work is the people. One of the latest advances, telepresence, allows anyone, anywhere in the world, to jump into an expedition at any time. Telepresence provides a critical
scientists, resource managers, and the general public can tune in and become active members of the expedition. Amazing discoveries are not just limited to people on board the ship. Because of telepresence, even you can be part of ocean exploration as it happens. From your computer, from your tablet, even from your cell phone. You can tell we're Okay, hopefully you enjoyed our uh, science on the sphere here. We're going to get into the actual ocean here, um, see uh, how far or how deep we can go uh, without you getting a little bit scared. But um, the first layer of the ocean, we're going to go through the different layers. Um, if you ever wondered about the ocean or if you ever thought about even going near it, one thing is we kind of just think about what's on top of the ocean. We don't normally think about, well, it kind of drops off uh, about four miles down from here. Uh, we don't think about those things, but sometimes we do, and sometimes we get nightmares, and we get scared, and we're like, we're never going to the ocean ever again. But let's talk about some safe zones. Uh, the sunlight zone, it goes from the surface of the top of the ocean there down 660 feet. Um, this is where you get uh, dolphins swimming. This is where most of life is um, really up and ready to go. Um, you have your predators, you have your prey in there, and then that whole food chain that's going on there. Um, that's where a majority of it is. Um, you also have a lot of uh, ocean plants or sea plants that are in there uh, that need the sunlight to still come through. That's a majority of the sunlight going through. Um, the next layer that we're going to be talking about is the twilight zone. Not like, <laughs> not like the show or nothing crazy like that, but it does show a little bit of light that still comes in. Um, as we're going through these zones, I'm going to talk about some creatures you might find there. Um, so if you have somebody that's next to you and you get scared at any point in time, just make sure to hold on tight. We're still going to go a little bit further down. Um, that goes from 660 feet down to 300 or 3,300 feet. Um, this is where we get into some creatures that kind of need a little bit of light to live and kind of um, have food around, food sources, but we still don't have completely darkness. Um, in that area, you do get a couple of different creatures. One um, that is really cool is a uh, frogfish, which at this point in time, um, what I want you to do is, if you don't have a piece of paper handy or something to write with, um, go ahead and do so real quick. Come back to me. I'm going to describe these creatures to you, and I want you to draw them out and see if you uh, get them pretty correct or kind of what you think they are. Um, so we're looking at frogfish. Um, it, they kind of sound like what you think they are. Uh, frogfish have extended uh, fins out, and they kind of look like frog arms. Um, those are used to kind of come down um, any surface or the, the seafloor. Um, one thing is that they are related to the anglerfish. Um, if you don't know what the anglerfish are, those are a little bit deeper down. They have the giant light bulb above their heads. The ones that were, <laughs> when you think of deep sea, you think of those because they have that giant light bulb. Um, I know they get a bad rap for having these giant teeth and um, kind of just eating anything they find down there. But let's stick to the frogfish. The frogfish is pretty cool because it mirrors somewhat like a frog. Um, they do kind of linger down at the, the seafloor. And what they do is uh, they kind of wait for their prey. They can't eat too big of a meal, but um, they do resemble that frog. Now, at this point in time, if you do have a paper at home, what I want you to do is try to, try to draw what this would look like just from the description. Um, so we have frog kind of fins, hands, um, they crawl around, they're related to the anglerfish, which have these giant teeth, and um, they're kind of like little eyes, but um, they kind of can open their mouth a little bit wider than a goldfish can. Um, and if you think about it, it's a, f a frogfish is somewhat like a goldfish that never miss a day at the gym. So if you can think about that, um, you have a real good understanding. So go ahead and draw that out and what that looks like. Next, we're going to move on down to the midnight zone. Uh, the midnight zone is probably a huge chunk of the depth of the ocean. We go from 3,300 feet down to, 30, or down to 13,100 feet. 
this is a huge chunk. This is when we're looking at the real depth of it. Um, when we're looking at those, we also have, uh, we have barrel, barrel-eyed fish. Barrel-eyed fish are pretty interesting. Uh, they have a huge head that is uh, transparent. Um, a lot of people thought they weren't transparent, but as we discover these animals, we only get a little bit of information on them because scientists don't have uh, the full grasp on all these creatures yet. Um, so we, anytime we collect animals like that or that we come in contact with them, we try to study them a little bit more. Um, they have these transparent head, but inside the head, you have these giant eyeballs, and they can look straight up. So they can be swimming straight at you, but they can be looking straight up. Um, a lot of scientists thought that these two little holes in the front of the fish uh, were the eyeballs, but they're wrong. It's, um, it's the nostrils where they can sense stuff. Um, then they went back and they said, whoa, this guy has these two nostrils up front and then the eyeballs that can kind of rotate back and forth. So they went back and they collected more data off of that. Um, barrel fish or barrel eye fish um, are really fragile. It's that transparent head that they have there. Um, you'll find those guys in the midnight zone. Um, and rarely do they come up to the coast, but um, any time that they come up to the coast and we collect more data off of it, um, it's something pretty amazing because you don't really think of any fish out there that have transparent heads. Um, going down from the midnight zone, we're gonna go down to the abyss. The abyss, a lot of people know what this means because it's the deepest part of the ocean. Um, but there is an exception to that. The abyss goes down from 13,100 feet down to 19,700 feet. Um, this is the lowest part of the ocean there. Um, what we wanna talk about here is that there are creatures down there that haven't been sent, seen yet or they haven't been um, observed in their, uh, what, how they eat or how they, um, how they live down there. Uh, so that's all still pretty new to us. Um, there was an expedition here uh, in 1960, it was called the Trias, and they went down, there's a couple of scientists that went down and they tested out, they wanted to get to the bottom floor. As they went to the sea floor, um, right before they stopped at the bottom of the sea floor, they heard a big clank in their submarine. Now, if you know anything about submarine, uh, submarines, they tend to put pressure going inwards to that Boyle's gas law. Um, all the pressure gets pushed in. So if they don't have something that is structurally sound, uh, a submarine like that, going down that deep would be extremely horrifying. Um, but scientists push the envelopes, they, they always go out and they always do observations, they collect data, they do all types of different science that give us more information. It gives the uh, world knowledge anyways. But going back to their expedition, going down um, to the seafloor, they actually landed on the seafloor. They were only able to stay there for about 20 minutes. So as they went down, and you'll know where all this cardboard's coming from, they said, hey, we're here and we can only stay for 20 minutes, so we can only collect certain data. Um, as we get down there, they collected, um, it was a rock fish that was down there, they collected that information, they brought that information back, and within 20 minutes, it had to come back up because of the limitations of the submarine. Now, there have been a couple of people gone uh, down to the sea floor, but it hasn't been as successful, and some people have gone down, uh, to include uh, James Cameron, the guy that did uh, Avatar and Titanic, uh, those films, he did go down and he made his own submarine. Now, he stayed there for about six hours. Um, he collected a lot of data and then that data was brought back. But let's go ahead and move back to the abyss. Um, let me talk about one more creature that might give you nightmares. So at this point we have our, um, <laughs> we have our uh, frogfish, we have our barrel-eyed fish, um, I'm going to give you one more in there that you want to start drawing out. Tell me what this looks like. Um, it's going to be the goblin shark. Uh, the goblin shark sounds pretty scary. Um, if you look at the goblin shark, it's not going to turn you into stone or anything like that, but they do have a huge pointy nose, uh, like kind of like goblins uh, normally do. But these guys have big giant um, uh, teeth sticking out. Uh, kind of give you nightmares, 8 to 12 feet long. Um, pretty, pretty big, it can make some damage. But that guy lives in the abyss zone. One more that I wanna talk to you about is a smaller uh, dwarf lantern shark. Now, these guys are underneath the abyss, or underneath the midnight zone, 
And these guys right here are pretty amazing. They do some things where um, they can light up. That's called bioluminescence. Um, these are chemicals within the animals themselves, the creatures uh, that have adapted. They have adapted to their environment. Um, these chemicals inside their bodies creates a glow and they light up. Now, two things that they can use that for. One, they can light up um, to scare all their predators away and say, hey, I'm over here, um, don't eat me. Uh, and then two is they can light up to kind of uh, stir in the curiosity of other fish that are around. Um, if I'm a smaller fish and it's a completely dark and the lights come on, I'm like, huh, what is that over there? But if I'm like a goldfish, I'll probably head straight for it and say, huh, there's light over there. Um, there's also a couple of things that scientists have said that the dwarf lantern sharks have are two dorsal fins in the back. And when they turn on, they have the lightsaber effects. So it can pitch dark. You can see two lightsabers. And <laughs> normally, that would be pretty crazy. Um, but um, we still can't get a full grasp on the deep side of the ocean. So there's tons to learn. There's still tons of things to learn. Um, but now we're back at the abyss zone. The abyss, once we get down, we go into the Mariana Trench. That kind of comes down a little bit like that. And that would be the deepest side of the ocean. Now. We're about 6.8 miles down, and that's where we find our trench. Now, this is where uh, the explorer's expedition uh, had led them to, down to the trench. So it's the deepest part of the ocean. This is where we collect data. The um, scientists have found that we have uh, certain creatures that we never knew about. We have creatures that we still don't know about. Um, it's all about collecting the information, collecting the data off of them. Now, I want to talk to you a couple about uh, a couple different things. We do have um, we do have uh, current scientists that are going around the world right now to include the Nova the NOAA scientists. Uh, they're on the Okeanos expeditions. They go out. They do the depth. Um, they have smaller submarines where they can send people so they don't have anybody in harm's way. Um, to include uh, divers, um, divers normally use equipment that have adapted. Because if you don't have equipment that's adapted to the environment, um, it'll put them in harm's way. Um, a couple of different things that I want you to know and take from our little experience here is that what do the animals need? What do everybody else need? They need to adapt, right? The adaptation, adaptation to these environments. Um, the dwarf lantern shark that use those lightsabers and the bioluminance to uh, light up. Um, they're not the only ones that do it. We also have animals and creatures here on the surface of the earth, like uh, fireflies. They light up, and that is a bioluminance that they can use within their bodies. Um, so in order to wrap things up here a little bit, I'm going to give you an idea of something to do um, as of right now. You can add in your comments. You can put those in and see what that looks like. Uh, but we do have an activity for you. It's kind of like a mysterious side of the ocean, but it's safely here on, on Earth. Um, on our website here, you're going to be able to see uh, a couple different ways to do this activity, but I'm going to kind of give you a quick overview. And knowing that we're all kind of stuck at home a little bit, um, I kind of look for things that will be available to you, or you can just like run to your garage and get stuff, or um, even find any, any of these uh, supplies around your house. Um, so. First, we have a regular plain box. If you look, I've cut out the inside of the box. Um, nothing fancy here. There's no wires or tricks or anything. Um, just the box. Um, we left the bottom side. And what we did here, we cut holes on the side, big enough for you to stick your hand in. Okay. If you know where I'm going with this, this is going to be pretty awesome because you can try it at home. Um, so I just took a CD, or what the cool kids call now, compact disc. Put it right here, trace it, cut it out, be able to stick your hand in there, be able to move around. Then I got, whoop, then I got a blindfold, bandanas, anything that you can cover your eyes with. So you have Explorer 1 will be blindfolded and then stand behind the box. Uh, Explorer 2, which is the next person that's in front of them, will be um, the one that will be able to laugh about everything, basically. But if you get an object from your home, any object, don't tell them what it is, then put it in the box. Okay? Once it's in the box, 
Explore one that's blindfolded will stick their hand in here. Do not give them clues. Once they stick their hand in here, they'll find out what's inside the box. Kind of like the deep sea. Deep sea has tons of mysteries to it. We didn't even touch the surface, pun intended. But if you can put any object in here, what's going to happen is they're going to have to figure out what is that object. Now, I know there's tons of things you can put in here. Um, one really cool thing that I want you to share with us is if they are sticking their hands in here, we'd want to see, take a couple of pictures, post it on our site, um, share with us what you're doing. Um, share with us your, your uh, descriptions of that uh, dwarf lantern shark, that um, barrel-eyed fish, um, the frogfish, and the goblin shark. Share with us what those might look like. Um, and then post it on our website here, and then we can figure out a couple of different things, um, what you guys want to hear more about, and um, introduce with uh, the science on the sphere. Anything else that you'd want to let us know, go ahead and share that with us. It's the MCC Continuing Education uh, Facebook page. Let us know what you think. Any, any questions, let me know. Send them out. Anthony, thank you so much for this presentation. Um, I have to let you know that there are a few questions coming across, so I oh, hope sorry. you're ready and prepared. <laughs> okay. So one of the questions is, well, uh, here's a comment. So fish can be like a deer caught in headlights. <laughs> nice. <Yes. laughs> That's so weird. So we have another question that says, are all oceans that deep down? I had no idea it went so far down. Yes, there's um, some part of the oceans that do not go that far down. Um, the uh, Mariana Trench is off the coast of Japan. That's the deepest side. Uh, that's where a lot of expeditions happen because that's the deepest side that you can go into um, the surface or the sea floor. So there is one expedition out there right now that's called the Jody's Resolution. That expedition out there is actually putting, um, they're drilling down to the surface of the earth um, underneath all the ocean water. So it's get, giving us a little bit more information on how, um, how long has the surface been there. So we had another question, and the question asked, um, do you have pictures of the sea creatures? But the reason we don't have pictures of the sea creatures is because of the activity. Yep. Yeah, one thing I want you to do is start using your mind on how these things would look like. Are you close? Go ahead and draw it out, even on a post-it note. Really small, um, nothing too fancy. Don't get into the different shades of colors on there. Just, just an idea, a sketch, if you will, a sketch of what these things would look like. Once you let us know what that looks like, take a picture of that, and then we can put up the pictures of what they really look like. Don't cheat. Don't go online and look them up. Just do your best. What do you think these animals and creatures look like? Now think about it. If you land in the ocean or if you go down in the ocean, um, you won't have flashlights, or if you do have flashlights or any type of light, it's limited. So think about how they would also look if they were out there in the wild. So Anthony, I'm guessing that these deep sea creatures are um, not edible. <laughs> uh, some of them are not edible. Um, some of them are just really crazy looking. I have, I have a thing that says if the creature looks extremely crazy, I'm not eating it, but it's up to you. Uh, some I know might be poisonous, but it's also a couple other things that scientists do to study um, what these creatures do, where they live, what are their ecosystems like, and how do they reproduce as well. So thank you so much, Anthony, for being with us here today. So students and parents, uh, go ahead and post pictures of your activity right in that Science on a Sphere um, post, and we will be contacting you with some goodies. And also, next Friday, we will have another Science on a Sphere Home Edition at 5 p.m. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you next week.